Every day is an opportunity for you to learn something that sets your home improvement or home services business apart from the competition. Let's make today one of those days. This is a podcast for home improvement and home services marketing. This is Built By. You've got to be adaptable. You've got to find a way to accommodate an uncomfortable customer. If you're not getting the home advisor leads in the first five minutes, you shouldn't even do it. Hopefully we're eating their lunch while they're trying to get back up and running. Hey, what's up guys? Matt here with Hatch in another episode of Built By. I hope everything's going awesome for you on this Thursday, April 1st, April Fool's Day, which means, as you probably already knew by now, that I don't actually have Bob Veal on the podcast today, as sad as I am to admit that. Um, You know, schedules got crossed, uh, lines of communication got mixed up, and he's also never responded to an email that I've ever sent him, so there's that. That might have something to do with it too, but... So today's podcast is a little bit out of the ordinary, um, other than not having Bob Vila on. Um, you've probably noticed by now this is an audio-only podcast. It's been kind of a crazy week, but I really wanted to highlight this like nugget of information that we found earlier this week, which is uh, picking the brain of one of the top founders and CEOs of one of the best remodeling companies in the country. So my co-marketing partner, Josh Carter, hosted a webinar Um, We partnered up with our friends over at Socialist Marketing, and we invited Brian Gottlieb, who is the founder and CEO of Tundraland Home Improvements, on to the webinar to discuss some of the things he's seeing in the market um, from his perspective, really honing in on that state of remodeling, what things look like right now um, as it pertains to the home improvement industry, um, what he's seeing um, internally in his company, some of the things that they're doing and seeing success with. So this was a really, really valuable webinar. And Josh hosts these like two to three times a month and every one of them is a home run. So I'm definitely going to drop the links if you're interested in attending any of those. They're free, um, literally free information coming out of the wazoo. It's pretty awesome. So I don't want to take up too much time in the intro because it's kind of a long episode, but it's very, very um, interesting. And it's awesome to get those insights from somebody that's actually in the field and seeing these things as you all are as well. Um, So you can listen from one of the top 500 remodeling companies in the country to see what they're doing. And hopefully you can take a few things out of this and apply it to your business as well. So I'm going to go ahead and kick the episode off. Uh, Again, this is my co-marketing partner, Josh Carter, our friends over at Socialist Marketing. And our guest today is Brian Gottlieb, who is the CEO and founder over at Tundraland Home Improvements. Enjoy. So first question for you, Brian, Uh, obviously COVID-19 brought about a lot of industry changes. What did you make last year that you intend on keeping this year? Right. Yeah. Thanks for the question, Josh. So, you know, it's interesting because like everybody, COVID was, was, was so disruptive for our businesses because we didn't know which end was up. We didn't have all the information to make all the right decisions. Uh, so, so what we did know is early on, we needed to come up with ways to keep our employees safe, to keep our customers safe, and, and quite frankly, to stay in business. I mean, the, the first rule of business is to stay in business. So, so that was like the goal. But where, where it led us to is because we didn't have all the answers, it was super important for us to make sure we were great communicators with our team. And we moved to a, to a structure where we where different leaders in our organization, myself included, by the way, I would, we would have a daily huddle with, uh, with my leadership team. My leaders would have a daily huddle with, with, with their managers and, and the frontline managers would have a daily huddle with their team. Uh, we also had to move the whole business remotely practically overnight. Uh, so, so in the early days, those were things that we did without the without realizing the benefit of it. What we've learned and we've kept it is that you know daily huddles have have made such a positive impact in our business. It's such a basic principle, but it's really, I mean, I think in any growing organization, one of the big challenges is communication gaps, and and daily huddles really help keep everybody on the same page. Even some days we have absolutely nothing to talk about. You know what? That's okay. There's nothing wrong with that. It's about the it's about the, the mechanics and the habit of a daily huddle. Uh, working remotely, I don't know that we'll, we've got 40 some odd people in our call center. 
I don't know that we'll ever have a business where everybody's back in a bullpen dialing. I think it's a, I think it's a more productive way that people, we, we open up to a wider pool of people that we can have single moms that maybe want to work for a couple of hours here and there. It's just, it, it, now, of course, what comes with that is you got to make sure you're not losing your culture when you have a whole bunch of people working remotely or you're not creating silos. But that was in the early days of COVID. Once, like all of us though, who knew this was going to be a home improvement boom? And what we saw was, oh my gosh, where where our, our backlog, you know, business is unbelievable. It's grown like crazy. The other thing we had to do is we had to shift our focus from being a home improvement company to being a training organization. Uh, we knew that if we're going to really drive down our backlog, and I know we're going to talk more about this a little bit later, if we're really going to uh, drive down our backlog, we have to reimagine the way we onboard an installation team, uh, the way we train them, the way we expedite them, uh, the, the way we compensate them, and, and, and even the way we recruit them. So we had to change the way we we, we, we looked at the back end of our business. And, and by the way, included in that is how do we simplify the business so that the training is, is a lot easier. So uh, all of those things are things we're going to, that are, that are have actually made us stronger and they're going to continue to make us stronger. And especially when you think about your business as a training organization, all of a sudden it becomes a strong competitive advantage. I love that, Brian. You talked uh, a little bit about that culture and I'm sure we're going to touch on this, or at least I hope we're going to talk, talk on this more in depth, but how do you, sure. What are some quick ways to kind of keep a company that is spread apart, regardless of the size, from siloing or or just feeling, you know, not a part of the team anymore? Yeah. So look, it's it that, that's a that's a huge question, Ted. Right? How do you how do you how do you salespeople don't like production people, production people don't like salespeople, and nobody likes the call center and all of that, right? And and, and hopefully everybody likes the CEO. I don't know, but anyway, but but it, it's really about. I mean, to me, it's about. It's about uh, what we've done in our organization, and we're going to talk more about this in some of these other questions, is uh, is one of the key roles of a manager is to work across silos. And, and it, it's so important that your organization has a vision statement, but also each department has its vision statement. And, and for everybody to understand how those, those different uh, businesses uh, work together. And if you think about internally, uh, if you think about the supplier-customer relationship inside of your own organization, if, and we'll just take a call center and we'll just take a sales team and just look at those two. If you think about the, the call center's biggest customer is their sales team. And they're in the, they're in the business of supplying good appointments to the sales reps. Uh, the, the production's biggest customer, you know, the sales rep sells jobs to the production department. And if you keep a, 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 a supplier customer relationship throughout the whole organization, you can then have conversations internally how can we be a better customer and how can we be a better supplier? And, and it's those conversations that really drop silos down. If you're not having those conversations that, hey, how can we be a better production team for the sales force? And sales force, how can we be a better, a better deliverer of, of goods to you, the production team, for you guys? What do we need to do better at? But the more you have those kind of conversations, the, the more everybody's pulling the same direction. And that's really what helps a lot. So, so in terms of changes that you made last year, and obviously you talked about those adjustments uh, with those team huddles, uh, what do you see kind of just looking, looking not necessarily to 21, but maybe past 2021? What, what are some of the things that you're seeing that you might have to adjust to and, and changes that you might see in that industry? Yeah, I think, well, I think the risk we all face in the uh, home improvement industry, and it really shows up in the, on the window side of things, mm -hmm. Uh, you know, in the bath business, we've always been really good at, uh, at hiring people and turning them into installers really quickly. Uh, it seems like the the window industry there's this uh, it, it's a lot more difficult, and and the 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 pool of quality window installers, you know, that 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 that, that it gets thinner and thinner because people are aging out, and there aren't a lot of people saying, "Boy, I want to I want to graduate high school and install replacement windows." And and I think that's I think that's a risk for all of us in the industry. We have to say, as an industry, how do we, you know, how do we become a cool industry to work for? How do we how do we how do we tell our story at uh, at tech schools and at high schools that it's a respectable. Uh, career path that people can have. This isn't just about 
doing construction. It's about doing noble work and 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 looking at what you just did and feeling good about it. And and I think, but along with that is you know the type of company that you want to be too. That I think people don't want to just install windows. I think that they want, if they're going to go to work for a company, you know, they, they want to join a culture that's impactful too. And that's where I don't think you can separate uh, the mission and vision of your business and what you stand for and your culture from your recruitment efforts and how not to, and, and b because, because there's an aging out population of installers, I think you have to, I think you have to adapt to, to what people, the types of businesses that people want to go to work for today. Um, I, and I think, and I, oh, the other thing I think is that, look, it, it would have been really super hard to navigate. And maybe some of you had this problem that are on this uh, webinar right now. Uh, in the early days of COVID, maybe you weren't paperless. Maybe you weren't uh, using the right technology on your, in your, in your phone system and trying to navigate how do I separate people, keep them safe while passing folders around. I think technology has played a huge part in our success in 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 allowing us to grow through these difficult times. I mean, we've been paperless since before it was cool, but I think that it's going to be hard if, for companies, if you're trying to compete, if you're trying to compete uh, in 2022 and 2023 and 2024, and you haven't embraced technology in your organization, I, th I think you're going to be, I think you're going to be uh, uh, competing with one hand tied behind your back. And I think you're going to be at a competitive disadvantage. And I think that's, that's going to really start to show itself over the next couple of years. Yeah, Brian, did you see any technological innovations happen in 2021 or did that kind of stall? Or excuse me, 2020? Yeah, I mean, look, I, I think that what we, what we learned is there 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 have been things out there. I mean, Hatch, you know, what you folks do is one example of it, right? How do we, you know, how do we how do we find other ways to communicate with our customers, whether they're buyers or non-buyers, using technology? Because maybe you can't hire up enough call center people in order to to reach people. So how do you how do you lean on technology to help? Uh, but 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 I mean, there there are so many good tools out there that 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 can be used. It, it, I, I think every company needs a needs a champion of technology in order to implement it. Though I think that's really super important. That's a great point. Really incredible answer so far. I wanted to get into some of the specifics here on on growing the business because yeah. hopefully in this group of attendees there's. The next Tunderland, or you know, the next bigger than Tunderland, even. And what are you know some of the tangibles that you wish you knew, and some of the things we can talk through? So the first one here is, look, I know you can't go back, and and it always where I wouldn't change the thing to get us where we are today. But you know, if you could advise the younger you or the person who's starting the next you know Tunderland, yeah. what's something you did wrong, or something you wish you had adapted quicker? that kind of yeah. helped make some of those leaps with the, the ability of, of looking back on it. Yeah. So when I first started the business and, 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 and Dave Cerrone from Fitch Construction is on here. He was one of the people I used to visit with and, you know, consult with. And, and he knew, you know, first and foremost, I'm a, I'm a sales and marketing kind of guy, right? I'm going to go in the home and I'm going to do a presentation. I'm going to, I'm going to sell a project. And that's how I grew the business. And if you would have asked me back in 2009, do you think I'll ever grow a big business without me running appointments? I would have said, this is just not a chance. I, I, you know, I'm the sales guy, right? But, but what I learned quickly early on, and, and, and in some ways I, I, I waited too long, is the key to business is to hire to your weaknesses as quickly as possible. Yeah, I, I, be honest with yourself and hire to your weaknesses as quickly as possible and get the heck out of the way. Because I'll tell you my personal journey. My personal journey was here I am, you know, a, a person that felt very confident running a sales call. But what I was doing is I'm pulling up to somebody's home and I'm I'm on the phone with my production manager trying to solve a, a problem with their with their sunroom and I'm dealing with this other thing over here and then I'm gonna put my phone down and try to walk in and do a real sales presentation and what I found is I was actually shortcutting the thing that I was really good at. What you want to do is you want to hire to your weaknesses and 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 understand that as an organization that you don't ever want to be the bottleneck. You know, I mean, and, and ever want to be the bottleneck. If you fast forward today, if you were to come to my office, you'll see a desk with uh, in my at Tundraland. I don't have any drawers in my in my office. There are no drawers because I don't want a piece of paper in my office. Because if there's a piece of paper in my office, it's in the wrong place. That means I'm the bottleneck. So I would say if, if when growing a business, 
think bold and think about a great org chart and build out an uh, you know it, uh, always start with your org chart and 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 you'll 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 really really you'll really soar a nice business. I love that. And and I think everybody's always wondering, I mean, people here are all across the board. Some folks are doing less than a million. Some folks are doing five. And I saw some companies that are even up, upwards of, of 20, 25 million. What was that thing? Because a lot of companies have a hard time scaling past a certain amount, right? What yeah. was that catalyst that helped you make that jump from, from 5 million to, to booking 10 million in jobs uh, in a year? Yeah. And it, it seems like, it almost seems like a lifetime ago, you know, so this year we're trending to a $134 million in revenue. Yeah. That's, a, that's a, it's a big business, you know, but, but, but early on in those days, uh, you know, what, what was five to 10, you're doubling your business. And, and maybe some of you on this webinar have doubled your business over the past year. And what you probably have realized is that as you start plugging systems into your business, by the time it's time to implement them, you've already outgrown the system that you're trying to plug into your business. And it's, it's, it's clunky, it's imperfect, it's not easy, and that's why not everybody does it. I, that's the first thing you should know, is that I think it's about making sure that, number one, that you, you know, share a big vision for your team. Let them know where you're trying to go, but also let them know that the journey is not going to be a perfect one, okay? You're it, growing a business from five to $10 million means you have to be very entrepreneurial. And, and, and being entrepreneurial is, is not having all the answers. I think you know, the, the, the risk companies run when in growth is, is to want to plug something in, but you don't because it's not perfect yet. Never let perfection stand in the way of progress. Okay, when you're trying to grow a business, it's about making change and adapting as you go. Uh, and then also, but I think also it's about you got to have faith in your people. You've got to say, yeah, you know, I can invest in, I can spend this on marketing and I'm going to see a result from it. I'm, I'm going to sell this backlog, but we're going to build it down. And I'm going to be able to repeat, repeat, repeat because, because I'm no longer the bottleneck and I'm trusting in a team and I'm willing to invest in it. I love that, Brian. And in terms of processes that you're implementing in the business and growing the team, what are there different changes that you might have to make going from 20 to 40 million? I mean, what 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 roles may might you be hiring for at that stage? Like, are, is there yeah. changes? Yeah. So it's, it's are they the it's, same problems, just bigger ones? <laughs> well, I, I think what happens in an organization, the, the risk that every organization has is that as an if you look at if you look at the a typical org chart. You've got the CEO at the top, then you have some sort of an executive leadership team, then you have a frontline manager, and then you have people that face the customer. So if you think about uh, people that face the customer, sales reps, installation people, marketing people, organizations train the heck out of these people. We script them, we practice them, we role play with them. They have to know a script before they can go visit with a customer. They have to know a script before they can get on the telephone. They have to, they have to know how to install something. And so, so they get really, the frontline people get really developed in our, in our industry. Okay. The, the executive leadership team, well, they're talking to the CEO all the time. They get developed like crazy. The people that get, get neglected in an organization are the frontline managers. The frontline managers are the ones that are often where the training gap is, where we put somebody in that role typically because, well, they, they're the most experienced, so I'm going to make them a manager. But have we really taught them what it means to be a good manager? Uh, you know, if I if I can go down a rabbit hole with you for a minute, I'll share with you that that Google hires a bunch of really really smart people. We all know that, and and Google at one point in their in their life cycle, they questioned: Are managers even important? Do they even matter? You know, we have all these techies. Do, do managers even matter? So they actually for for them to I mean, they're, they're, it's Google. Okay, so so for them to 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 answer the question if managers matter, they have to then prove the opposite. So they went out to prove the opposite, that managers don't matter inside of their organization. And it's called Google Project Oxygen. I invite anybody to Google Google Project Oxygen. They spent hundreds of millions of dollars to prove that managers don't matter. And what they found is the exact opposite. Not only do managers matter, but there are 10 behaviors to a great manager. And, and, and they list them out. And it's, you know, to be a good coach to empower a team and not micromanage them, to create an inclusive team environment that shows uh, care and, and concern for, for their team, to be, uh, to be productive and results oriented, uh, to be a good communicator, which what that means is to both listen and share information, you're back to silos, to support career development and discuss performance with your team, performance reviews, all that kind of stuff. Uh, a good manager has a clear vision and strategy for their team. 
They have the key technical skills to help uh, advise their team. They collaborate across different divisions and they're strong decision makers. That's the Google Project uh, 10. It, it's on Google. They have their whole management training program up online. If you ever want a really good management training program, Google Google Project Oxygen and just use theirs. That's what we do. We just have implemented it through our whole organization. I love that. And, and I did. Go ahead, Ted. Oh, go ahead, John. I was just going to say, I did have a, a, a little sort of follow up question back to kind of along the silo piece, too, is as you have employees that are or, or departments that may not entirely come back. Some will work remote, you know, or or key employees. I've been reading more and more about a, a concern with, you know, um, remote employees being viewed as as not a good and not as good as in-house employees, um, just because they're not there. Just the sort of they're not in the room. They're more likely to be passed over. How do you how do you keep some of that? back to the culture how do you keep some of that equity to let a a department that may be partially remote or an employee that may be fully remote you know still feel a part of the team and still be viewed as just as viable as somebody in the building right so so pre-covid if you were to come to tundra land first of all you couldn't find a parking space because we, we we've got cars all over the place and when you're when you're hiring someone and you're onboarding them, you're you're taking them through the different rooms, and there's this energy and it's rah rah rah, and it's welcome and the culture and the feel and the vibe and all that stuff. And now you're onboarding somebody and you're having a Zoom meeting, and now they're working from their living room. And and I think you know I think we as an organization have to really quickly understand how do we truly onboard somebody differently? Who should they meet? How do we? Look, we can still, we, you know, there's no reason why new employees can't meet with our leadership team once a week and understand a little bit about the mission, vision, and values of the business. There's no reason why we can't celebrate publicly that somebody's been with us 90 days and congratulations, and that's really cool, and, and make it celebratory. I think just the fact that they, I mean, you know, just the fact that they work remote, I think if we, if we can't allow that to be an excuse as to a reason why somebody feels uh, isolated. It's our responsibility as leaders you know, to really create an inclusive team environment. And by the way, it's one of the, it's one of the uh, uh, number three on Google Project Oxygen. Yeah, Brian, and one of the great ways that you've solved for that is those daily stand-up meetings across right. the entire organization. I love that. So let's dive into, into charity. You know, we've been talking about growing the business, impact of COVID. Let's kind of stick it, take a step back and one of the things personally that I've been really impressed by is Brian and Tunderland's ongoing commitment to a lot of different organizations, uh, great organizations in, in Wisconsin. Uh, and uh, Brian, I, I think a lot of folks are definitely in, in the process of exploring doing charity work in their business. And, and maybe many are looking at it as like a, a means to do some marketing uh, in different ways. Um, What's your approach and how do you give back? What are some of the things that you guys do? So first and foremost, our mission statement of our business is to do well and do good. As an organization, what that means as a business is it's okay to make a decent profit, but you can make a decent profit decently. And that's what do well and do good uh, means. And we, we believe that the better we do as an organization, the more good we can do for the communities that we serve. So uh, look, I think, I, I think it's a it's a personal journey. For, I think I think that you have to you as an organization have to find what what's authentic to you and to your team. You know, by asking your team what they believe in, uh, and 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 then execute on that. And there was a time we used to just kind of write a check to uh, like the Boys and Girls Club, and it felt like the money was just going into some ocean, and and it wasn't really making an impact. We we made a decision early on that that we want to do stuff for individuals in our community that we want to that we want to make a positive impact in the lives of not just our customers and not just our employees, but people in the communities that we serve. And, and that's been, that, that's at the, that's at the core of our Tundra Land Cares uh, mission. And whether it's, uh, and if I can share with you some of the, some of the things we do, uh, one of the things we do is our, our windows for a cause program. So, and what that is, is when we, when we put new windows into people's homes, Instead of taking the old windows out and just throwing throwing them in the trash like like most companies do, we pull selected windows out of the trash and we work with local artists, community members, 
business owners, sports organizations, uh, uh, elementary schools, you name it. And we have people turn these old windows into beautiful art pieces. They repurpose them. And then once a year, we display these beautiful art pieces uh, at a downtown Appleton. And we do it and we have food and, and music and we have a giant public auction. We invite people out to come and bid on these windows and people buy the windows. And we raise a ton of money every year and 100 mm -hmm. percent of all the money that that's raised goes to make a positive impact in the life of another individual in our community. The very first year we did it, uh, there was this fellow. His name was John Green. He was a he was a Vietnam era war veteran and he's been stuck in a wheelchair for over 40 years. I mean, just imagine that. OK, well, we raised enough money to get John a custom wheelchair that stands up. The guy can stand up for the first time in 40 years off of windows that would normally go in the trash. That, it, now, I'll, I'll share with you one. Over my, let's see, which shoulder is it? Oh, that shoulder there, that little, that little white background thing right there. That's uh, what we did uh, a few years ago is because we set up so many windows. I'm like, I wonder, how, what's, the, what's the record for displayed windows? So I actually called, uh, I called Guinness World Records, and I asked them, what's the record for the most displayed windows? And they said, well, it's a new category. We don't have one, but we love it. But it's it's 1,500 windows. You got to display 1,500. So we had this huge community calling. We had people bringing their grandkids down and painting windows. It was a whole weekend event. It was so much fun. The news media was there. And anyway, we ended up uh, setting a Guinness World Record for the most painted windows in any one location. So that, that's one example. Uh, the, another example, something a lot easier to execute on, is you know we're in the, we we do baths and showers and what we do is we, at music festivals or even any anywhere we see our displays we have uh, in our bath displays we have a microphone we have speakers and we have uh, uh, music instruments and we invite people to sing in our shower random people come on by sing in the shower do a tune we video it we put it on our Facebook page and once we get a certain amount of people singing in our shower. We then send a kid to music school for a year. So, so, so far we've sent like five kids to music school. And, and, and then of course we, our program with our veterans, which is baths for the brave, because a lot of uh, veterans, you know, it's, it's the things that, the things that we all take for granted uh, is, is like, you know, taking a shower in your own home safely. That's, we just take that for granted. There are a lot of people, proud veterans that have served our country that are literally afraid of their own bathroom because they have a bathtub that's dangerous to step over. We see that as simply unacceptable. And, and if we can change some of that, then good for us. So we, we started crashing veterans' uh, bathrooms and do free bath projects. Where it's turned into, now I've got uh, there last year in, on, uh, on Veterans Day in 14 states, 14 states across the country, myself and other like-minded home improvement companies just like you, we surprised veterans with free baths all at the same time, all at the same day, just in time for Veterans Day. And, and we think that is, to me, you know, it's to me, that's what culture is about. It's about getting the team involved in making a positive impact in the communities that we serve. I, I love that, Brian. It, it's a great journey that your team must have taken to kind of decide on where to focus. Um, yeah. I want to say, I feel like this industry is filled with musicians. I'm a drummer myself. I feel like, I mean, everybody, I've met, I've met like many, many bassists in this industry. So that's great. You're giving back to the music and arts community too, as well as the veterans. And you made a good point about that being, I don't want to say low hanging fruit, but uh, an easy, quick win to, to remodel, you know, a, a veteran's bathtub. Um, for those, for those companies that haven't really explored that charity, haven't gone through that journey that you guys took, what, what are what are some advice that you what's some advice that you'd give them when they're looking to invest in communities? Yeah, I mean, I th I think it's about it making make authenticity. You know, it's about business is about authenticity and it, mm -hmm. not something fake. And I would get with your team. You know, get with you to ask your people. What, what do we? You know, let's do something cool. What do we want to do? That's something cool that we can actually execute on and 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 change change somebody's life. You know, and it doesn't even have to be. It's not like you have to spend. You know. Fifty thousand dollars to remodel somebody's house. It could be yeah. it could be a random act of kindness that will mean is meaningful. It could be raking somebody's lawn. I mean, it, it, with your team, it could be raking a, a, a block of homes. It could be anything. It, it, it's the little things that make the big difference, and and your your team will feel really good because of it. That's great. Yeah, and, and I would I would add to that talking to as many contractors as I do. I think. There's a lot of contractors that do certain things, and it's not necessarily to the extent that you do it, Brian, but they, they don't always meet on how to 
you know, put the words out there or, or express when they participate in, you know, breast cancer awareness walks or even like supporting like the local high school football team or, or the Girl Scouts, you know, yeah. as, as Josh showed earlier with the millennial group being a larger buyer seg segmentation, you're also going to see that there's an increase in wanting, you know, the dollars spent to go towards not just a good deal on my roof, not just a good deal on my windows, but going towards a company that you can trust and you feel good purchasing. You know, you see that type of, of you know, cause marketing being used, you know, really effectively. And I, I don't mean it like a dirty word that, you know, you want to highlight the things that you do as an organization and why a prospect should want to, you know, give Tunderland their money. I and you think know, that's completely reasonable. Yeah, and Ted, I want to I want to follow up on that because this is, a, this is a super important point when it comes to cause marketing or when it comes to doing good in the community. Because I'm sure that everybody on this webinar does something cool; they give their own way. And maybe you feel like, well, yeah, but I like to give quietly and I like to give anonymously, and that's all cool. But my, my feeling is this: I like to talk about it big and bold, very simply. For because what I want to do is I want to change the conversation in our industry. That's what I want to do. I want to I want to change the conversation on how a home improvement company can actually make a positive impact in the communities that we serve. And, and I do it for those for those reasons, because I think sometimes we can just change the conversation by simply talking about it. Absolutely. Absolutely. So the next section here, we're going to jump into, you know, some of the sales and marketing, getting into the nitty gritty of some of the numbers and just some recent numbers to kind of go through here before we jump into the questions. And, and these are, you know, national averages. So different states, different products, this is going to swing pretty crazy, but you know, $186 is the average cost per lead. And that's across multiple marketing channels um, An average job size being about $12,000 and, and a close rate, which I was pretty impressed with the saying that the average close rate of 59%, you know, it's really important now more than ever with the fact that there is an increase of cash coming through with people with these these checks with you know taxes there's going to be some people that have returns to kind of get your systems in place and really put the best foot forward when it comes to sales and marketing so the first question i would ask is something that i think is both near and dear to hatch and socius's heart here is you know what do you want your first impression to be with the prospect? Because I'm the firm believer that you are selling before a salesman or before Tunderland ever picks up the phone. So can you talk through some of that? Yeah. So the first impression, look, I think whatever you're doing in your organization, if you think about what should the platform of any marketing uh, be, it should always be uh, a digital. It should always be having a, a really, really strong website that's super easy to navigate. Uh, we use Socius. You know, we happy, happily to use Socius. We've been using them for years. Uh, and the reason we do that is we want if a, if a customer goes on your website and it's not a good experience for them, and they're having troubles trying to figure out how to fill out a form and they can't figure out even how to fill out a form. I don't want a customer getting frustrated when we're in the dating stage. And that's what it is when the dating stage. I want them to I want them to absolutely love every every part of it. I want that. I want that customer journey to be magnificent from the day we meet them to the day it's installed. And, and, you know, a strong website, a strong digital strategy. And look, and I want, I want to, if somebody's Googling us, I want to be able to be found. And again, I think having a strong website and web strategy, and if, I, you know, I, I'm going to plug Socius because they're just my favorite, uh, but, uh, you know, it, it, it'll change your business if you do it right. It'll change your business. So in terms of, uh, obviously, like lead comes in, you got a great website experience. Your sales rep sets the appointment, runs the appointment. Uh, a lot of folks are doing this thing called rehash, and I think a lot of different folks define it in different ways. And some people consider it, you know, negatively because you're just a lot of folks just use that to just increase the price. Uh, I know you're doing rehash right now. What does that look like in your business, and how successful is it? Yeah. So let me just let me just clarify rehash as a term is a very transactional relationship. It's, oh my gosh, we did, they didn't buy from us. We're going to go back in and see if we can sell. That's transactional. If you're only doing that, okay, I mean, I'm not going to tell you to not do that. 
But what I will tell you, the bigger opportunity is uh, what's called continual process improvement. If you think about as an organization, you never want to get disrupted, right? And and how do you stay? How do you stay? How do you not get disrupted? I have to know not only why my buyers are buying from me, but I have to also know why my non-buyers aren't buying from me, which is in many ways more important. I want to know why the people that didn't buy didn't buy, because if I don't fix that problem, I could be disrupted as an organization. If you you want to know the frustration that the, the people that were trying to hail a cab, uh, why were they were frustrated? And if you knew that and you reacted to it, Uber wouldn't have disrupted your world. OK, you you you, you have to understand how to become a better organization. And you're going to become a better organization by understanding what from by, by listening to both the buyers and the non-buyers. If you think about it this way, uh, you've got your price you've, and, and you've got your cost, right? And an organization captures value, you as a company, the difference between how much it costs you to do it and how much you, you charge. And that's where you capture value. The consumer captures value by whatever the price was that you charge against the willingness to pay. How much were they willing to pay versus how much did they pay? That's where they capture value. You want to understand where you're capturing value and where you're not capturing value. So the point of this is this. Uh, talking to your non-buyers is super important. We automate the whole process. We automate everything. And we use a program called Hatch. And, you know, Josh, we work with your team on that. It's kind of cool because if, if I can tell you how we use it, it's not just about about our revisit and continual process improvement program, but 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 it's definitely used for that. But the other thing we use it for is, we, is again, we're, we're always trying to create a great customer journey. So let's say we go out to a home and they, there were two bathrooms in there and maybe we only did one of the showers and we know there's this other bathroom that one day wants to get done. Well, we could maybe try to call them all the time and say, hey, do you wanna get that other shower done? You wanna get that other shower done? Or I can use Hatch and I can create a campaign that is a drip campaign that will, 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 will communicate with that customer reminders why, hey, now might be a great time to really look at that second bath. I'm not then relying on the, on the human being to execute on it. I'm relying on the software. And it's just, it's, it's, or if somebody meets us at a home show and sets an appointment, I can tell them through Hatch what we're most looking forward to. Or if they didn't set an appointment, I can tell them why they, maybe they should have set an appointment. It, Hatch automates a lot of stuff that I think really helps you uh, as a competitive advantage. I love that. And you, and you touched on a little bit about the repeat and the add-on business. Um, so is there a process right now where, where a sales rep runs the appointment and let's just say you let's just say the, the, the deal is closed, right? They buy, they buy the windows. Yep. Um, how, how do you go back like, and, and who owns that in your business? Like, what does that look like to try to get that, that repeat or that add on business after yeah. the fact? Yeah, it's, it's it, like any organization. It's like, oh, my God, you know, your, your best customer is the one that's already bought from you. So, yeah. again, how, how can you automate some of that stuff? So if, somebody, if we go out to a home and there are eight windows in the home and people bought four, I can try to, I can try to remember to call them and, and, and create a call queue where we're calling them all the time. Or again, I can create a, a, some sort of an automated uh, program through Hatch and remind people of, of uh, about their and talk about why the, doing the rest of your windows in your home makes a whole lot of sense. I can create custom messages for that customer's unique situation. It's different than just sending out, hey, you ought to do windows. Well, we already did windows with you. I want to talk to this customer about why they should do the other four windows that they didn't do already. Uh, th this is, again, and what's really cool, by the way, is we're, we're, when... It was, there's something called an open API. What that means is, what's an open API? First time I heard that, I'm like, what the heck is an open API? What that means is it's this thing that allows two pieces of software to talk to each other. So we have our Improved 360 uh, CRM, and then we have our Hatch, and oh, by the way, we have Socius over here, and all of these things talk to each other through what's called an open API. So it's not like anybody has to do anything or push any buttons. So what happens is, uh, a lead gets resulted, it's sold, four windows, there are four more to do. It's uh, you know, the, the, the lead came through Socius, our website, we know which page they went on, uh, it's in our CRM, and then all of a sudden, an automatic uh, message campaign begins with Hatch automatically, uh, and, and you know what? I got to tell you something. We'd have to have 500 people just in our call center to try to to try to do that uh, manually. So it's kind of cool. <laughs> Love that. Appreciate appreciate the plug, Brian. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I think the really important thing too, and this goes across with you know with CRMs and with web companies and technology pieces like Hatch too, is 
is the speed that that allows as opposed, you know, like, cause you, you technically you don't have to have a CRM. You don't, you don't have to have a cell phone. You, you can pull over and use the pay phone or use maps. It's going, it's not going to work as well for you. There's, there's efficiencies here. And by having, you know, a website generating leads that can kick it into a CRM to let it hit your systems faster, regardless of the size of the company is going to improve your speed to lead and your ability to convert. You know, you don't want to be one of four people given a quote. You want to be the first one there, make the case and be the only one. Yeah. And, and by the way, you know, you asked the question earlier about 20 to $40 million. You know, mm -hmm. How do you grow from or 10 to 20 or 20 to 40? Uh, it's if you think about if you think about finding the right, what, what I call process partners, okay? I look at Socius as a process partner for our digital strategy. I look at Hatch as a process partner for us to uh, to take those that didn't buy and maybe turn them into buyers and learn something from them. Those that bought partials and turn them into full sales. I, I look at them as a process partner. Think about process partners in your organization and what process partners, because you can't do it on your own. In order to grow, what process partners uh, make sense for your organization? We were chatting before this webinar started. If I look at our first 75 days of this year, uh, take, you know, removing the COVID equation out of last year against the first 75 days of last year, pre-COVID, uh, our business is up 100, our old businesses combined, we're up 116%, which is a you know, huge growth for us. Uh, so, you know, it's super exciting, but yeah, there's, there's definitely labor challenges. However, uh, you know, I, I think, I think we've gotten pretty far ahead of it. You know, we, if you had asked me when I first started the business, what I was, I would tell you that we were a construction company. If you would have asked me, you know, five or six years ago, I would have said, well, you know, we're a sales and marketing company that happens to be in home improvements. If you ask me today, I'm going to tell you we're a training organization. Uh, we have, uh, we, we're able to bring, whether it's window installers or bath installers or any role that we're trying to fill, uh, we're, we're not necessarily looking for experience. We're looking to bring in a mass group of people. We, we, we've converted a ton of our warehouse space to classroom environments where we can teach how to lay down a drop cloth, or we can teach how to bend metal, or we can teach how to how to demo a bathroom, or we can teach you know how to install a window or how to cut trim. And we've actually created a, a full-on, like sort of like a tech school training organization. What this means is I can get people out of high school that likes to work with their hands, and I can teach them a craft and give them a career path. And it's just it's simply changed our business. And it and and again, I'm excited because we've got our marketing pedal to the metal because, you know, we feel that we're uniquely qualified to continue to take market share because of our lack of fear of building out our back of, of a backlog. Gotcha. And Brian, how, Brian, how is your team finding these candidates? Uh, uh, well, I, I mean, you know, if it's everything from Facebook marketing to working with Socius uh, through a, a, a jobs page to, oh, by the way, uh, hatch to, let's say, you know, you've got all these people that um, that you've gotten resumes for and you're trying to rehash resumes, you know, look, just because they weren't, they didn't call you back the, the, you, right away, create a, create an automatic drip campaign and see if you can, you know, use, use hatch for, for bringing some of these old candidates back in the loop, you know, it's about, about staying in communication, but you also have to treat lead generation like it's marketing. So when you get a, when you get a resume, to me, you got to call it immediately. You know, I, again, I, I would say to you, and I'm not just trying, Josh, I'm not trying to just try to sell your business here, but, you know, it, n there's not always somebody available to make a phone call and call a resume when it first comes in. But if it can come in and and all of a sudden Hatch is sending them an instant, hey, got your message, we're really interested in sending up a time and talking to you and creating that dialogue right away, th they're going to stop looking for other jobs because they got some feedback from you. You know, otherwise they're going to keep looking for another job and somebody else is going to hire them. Yeah, I, I love it, Brian, and that mindset, the mindset shift of when you're hiring, treat it, treat it like a lead, like a marketing lead, like your sales reps to run that lead. It's a, it's a great point because it's a big, big, big issue in the industry that a majority of you guys are are facing today. So, what about material shortages? So, I'm going to drop this poll, and while we're while we're polling the audience here, Brian, I mean, what what's been your experience? Obviously, lumber was a big issue, but that's not necessarily the space that you play in. Like, what what have you seen, and and how are you addressing that? Yeah. So, well, lumber in our deck business, we struggle with that I mean, the price point. But what we've done is early on when it, when when COVID first hit, uh, again, it was there were there were essentially five things we were focusing on, which was 
making, you know, number one, making sure we have tight communications internally. Number two, can we keep our employees safe? Number three, can we keep our customers safe? Number four, can we, you know, how cash management, stress test our PL? And number five, firm up supply chains. Those are the five things that we were focused on. And, and what we've done is we brought in uh, a lot of inventory ahead of time. Normally, we run a just-in-time model. If we are putting it in next week, we get it this week. We, we've changed that. We're bringing stuff in four, five, six weeks ahead of time. It's disruptive right now. Okay, it's super disruptive. Uh, my recommendation is this is a great opportunity if you're a business owner to 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 look at your businesses that you're look at the look at the products you're offering, and and if if you're not if if it's not a profitable product line, you or it's you might want to maybe not push it right now, you know, focus on those things that you can turn quickly uh, with that has a, re, you know, a, a reliable supply chain because you, know, what, you you don't make money until the job is installed. So, you know, really, really focus on that. And, you know, sometimes simplicity, you're going to scale your business by focusing on removing complexity and focusing on simplicity. Gotcha. Gotcha, Brian. And, and a question did come in from Michelle. She asked, what comes first, waiting until you have enough jobs to hire more people or hiring people then activate the team and then marketing efforts as well to get those jobs? She, she yeah. mentions that it's kind of a limbo. How do you approach that? Yeah. So I had the same debate with our uh, with my executive leadership team and all the different GMs. I have never in the life of my business had too many installers. I've never had that problem. Okay. It's always, I don't have enough installers. I don't have enough installers. So for me personally, I'm happy. I'm happy to invest and hire ahead of my needs on the back end because I know I've got good partners in marketing. I can always pull associates and say, turn up my ad spend. I can always pump up a TV uh, campaign. I can always hire salespeople. I can always generate more leads to keep the guys busy. So I, I, I always focus on building out your back end uh, beyond your, your capabilities uh, and and having the front end chase it. Yeah, I think that's a, a good point is, is always looking at, you know, essentially bench building. Even if you don't necessarily need the person today, you very well could need, you know, need them tomorrow. Um, along the same lines of, you know, the, the, the production process here is how do you look at, you know, what's the process when it comes to product lines or product manufacturers or vendors that you work with? You know, what what sort of things are you looking for and what tips can you give to contractors that are in that evaluation stage of I can maybe go with this window guy or this marketing company or this CRM, whatever the case? Yeah, I mean, first and foremost, when it comes to a, a manufacturer, if I can't get product differentiation, I'm not going to mess with it. That's me personally. If I can't have an exclusive product in a market, I'm personally not going to have an appetite to 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 take on that product line because it, it's very disruptive. Because you know we're not the cheapest game in town, and if they can start getting, if they can see prices for my products online, or they can, uh, if the consumer can see prices, or or if they can shop me in, in my market, it's probably not the right fit. There are other, if you know, we're growing, you know, we're we're a good company. We're a good partner for manufacturers. So I look for product exclusivity and I look for uh, products that, and it's, by the way, it's in our vision statement, is we look for products that add value to our customers and our company. And what I mean by that is can I install it quickly? Is it going to come in? Is it dependable? Uh, you know, what is their, can, are they going to deliver on their promise? Do they have a team of people that can help teach us what we need to know? Can I market it? Uh, can I make a margin at it that I need to make? And, you know, and is it not going to be disruptive? Is it sometimes people chase things that are out in left field? I've made the same mistake. I've chased products that what the heck am I selling this for? I'm, I must be out of my mind. And, and it becomes such a distraction. But the other point of it is that for me, if we can selling one or two things is really disruptive in our company. I need to be, I need to be able to sell 100 of those things a month. That's how we scale to, to do a one off and just sell it here once in a while or there once in a while. It's super disruptive for our company. So we look at things that we can scale to, and that's really important. You know, and while you're doing that poll, I'll share with you a concept here that, you know, if you think about even on, on the production side, you know, if you, if you, if you want to build a giant ship that's going to sail across the mighty ocean, mm -hmm. don't just simply uh, look to hire a whole bunch of people and teach them how to swing a hammer. You first have to get people to yearn for the open sea. And the more you get somebody to yearn for the open sea, the more magnificent a boat they'll build. 
So, so it's great to hire installers. Don't forget about the onboarding process and making that first day about culture and mission and vision and core values and opportunity and career path. Really make sure that first day of onboarding, whether they're a helper in your organization or whether they're a salesperson, that, 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 you, that they understand that, that they've joined an organization with, with a real career path opportunity. And because it's not just a matter of how many people you hire, it's how many don't you lose. So, you know, because if they, if people, people join organizations for culture and, you know, and you, and you want them to stick around. Good stuff, Brian. Yeah, no, that's a, a really good question. I, I did want to get, because we're getting close on time here. I want to try to cover some of these questions here. This one may be, maybe a quick one, Brian, but percentage of your overall budget on marketing. And, yep. and I'll ask before you say, if there's a hard number, is it the same regardless of the size of the business? Or do you have the luxury to kind of play with things if you get larger? It, it, it takes more fuel to get a plane going than it does to keep it level. I'll tell you that. So when you're trying to scale a business, you know, you're going to, you, you're going to make marketing mistakes and it's going to cost money. You know, the thing about that is just, it's okay to be wrong. Just don't be wrong for long. Uh, with, with, so, you know, measure everything. But, uh, you know, and, and, and different products have a different marketing uh, percentage. When I look at our marketing percentage, I look at a fully loaded marketing cost. That's with call center. That's with marketing managers. That's with costs. That's with showroom expense. And look, I think I think uh, in the in the replacement uh, uh, business, you want to be when you start getting over 15 or 16 percent, it's it, it kind of it, it's, it's kind of hard to it kind of really cuts into profitability. And I think you can run a, a really good business for between 14 and 16 percent fully burdened uh, as a marketing cost. Some divisions should run less than that. Yeah, absolutely. Call center should run about between two and three percent of your overall volume. If you look at your overall volume and you're trying to say what should my call center run, between two and three percent of overall volume is pretty is pretty common across the country. Gotcha. And then I, I saw in here too, Ken was asking, what's the most beneficial technology improvement you've implemented in the past few years? Um, Going paperless. Going paperless, um, that by far. Uh, it would, uh, what we do now, if you buy a bath from us, just to take the customer journey of being paperless. If you're buying a bath from us, the sales rep is having you sign a paperless contract. They're hitting submit. That contract is now inside of customer care. And the telephone is now ringing at the kitchen table where the salesperson is. And we have customer care on with the homeowner reviewing the contract that they just bought and giving them an exact installation date for their bath the moment they buy. That's operational excellence. It's almost impossible to do if you're not paperless. Yeah, and it seems like you kind of run that a, a an efficient organization from the get-go. It's having a website that says what you do, explains clearly who you are, the okay. process afterwards and getting in touch with them from different technology like Hatch makes it that much easier. Going yep. paperless, you're 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 giving a perception to the client as to what they can expect, which also then translates to the quality of work and gives you that that margin. And sometimes when there's mistakes or things don't go as well as if you're if you're exceeding expectations, it makes things a lot easier, right? Todd, there was a time in I said there was a time in this industry when you could say we have a lifetime warranty and nobody else did. Now everybody's got a lifetime warranty. Everybody's got all these. So the points of differentiation become you know super narrow. But you can make operational excellence a real point of differentiation. And by the way, that's the most difficult thing to compete with because it's organizational excellence. And and if you and if you focus on organizational excellence, it, and you're able to communicate that and prove that. It's a very, very defensible position from a competitive edge.